This is an amazing story. Uh, we had spoken earlier as he's going up to Jerusalem. Uh, I, I love uh, Matthew's account here, page 172 at the top. Uh, as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took 12 disciples aside, and on the way he said, we're going up to Jerusalem. That seems a little redundant, doesn't it? Uh, I write like that sometimes. Uh, this sentence says the same thing the next sentence says. But there it is. He's going up to Jerusalem, and he tells them, you know, I'm going to get crucified, be put to death, be raised the third day. Did you all circle verse 34 in, uh, I think it's Luke. Yes, Luke. They understood none of these things. These are verses we never, never memorize, hardly ever notice. And in reality, if we don't have that, we can't understand what's going on. This happened back in uh, Transfiguration period in a specialized ministry, as I mentioned. That, that phrase is mentioned two or three, that sentence is mentioned two or three times where uh, all this revelation comes, but they didn't get it. It was hidden from them. I think purposely so, so they could continue on in what they were doing. It all comes back to them later. That's what Jesus will promise you. All these things the Holy Spirit is going to bring back to your mind, and you'll have a great aha experience on the other side. He didn't quite say it that way, but that's what was going on, okay? Now, they're on their way to Jerusalem. They heard that. The mother of uh, Mrs. Zebedee heard that. Uh, we're on the way to Jerusalem. The king's coming to Jerusalem. It's the end of We've been in Galilee. We've been in Judea. We've been in Perea. We're on the way to Jerusalem. They heard that. And when they're getting to the capital city, she has a plan. Mother of the sons of Zebedee, that would be James and John, and came up to him with her sons. With her sons. I mean, this is the mama of the roost. A matriarchal kind of thing. And, it, and she brings the two boys along and says, uh, uh, Jesus, what do you want? She said to him, command, that's a pretty strong word, that these two sons of mine may sit, one at your right hand and one on your left, in your kingdom. We're going to Jerusalem. I heard that. I didn't hear about you dying, but I heard you were going up to Jerusalem. That's the capital city. You're going to be the king. Well, my boys, right side and left side of your throne. How would that be? Can you do that? Command it that be the case. How's that strike you? Yeah, that's, that's a pretty brash statement. This is uh, nepotism. You know what that word means? You know, you. <laughs> I shouldn't bring this up even. <laughs> you got a lot of relatives around you and you're pulling the strings. You don't pull strings as parents. Uh, grease the skids for your kids to get someplace. Uh, they earn it like anybody else, right? Isn't that the way it should be? Well, here's mama, and, and it's very hard. It's very hard to do. When it, well, you've got to know this. When it comes to relative things, I mean relational things, blood is thicker than water. Logic disappears on people. It's very hard to think impartially about your own relatives. Do you understand that? It's just the way it is. And you've got to be very careful to do things a, a, a biblical, honest way in working with one another that way. Everybody's got to earn their wings. There's no easy way. So, Miss Zebedee didn't think that. I got inside track. And she goes up and says, hey, honey, I think Jesus had to laugh at this one. <laughs> uh, Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm to drink? said, we are able. That's a pretty big cup. He'll be, he'll be praying that it passed from him pretty soon. But just in a brash, manipulative way, we're able. She said, he says, you're right. You're going to suffer very much the same way I am. But to sit at my right hand and my left hand is not mine to grant. It is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. The father's in charge of that kind of thing. Now, here's the, here's the kicker. How did the other disciples hear about this? This is something I, I expect James and John were sort of embarrassed when mom takes them by the hand to Jesus and say, I got a deal for you. What do you worry? I, I think they're embarrassed. But some way or another, this leaked out to the other guys. And this was not a good thing. When the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. You th would you be? Oh, this is really, this is bad. 
Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. You know, when you're a big shot in the Gentile world, when you're a big shot in the world, you like everybody to know you're a big shot. Have you been tempted with that? Any of you tempted with that in your life yet? I mean, we love to flaunt it. It's just part of the old nature. Jesus said, that's not the way it is. We're not to show off who we are. It's so hard, isn't it? Isn't it? And that's what James and John are about. Jesus said, that's not the way it is with Christians. Whoever would be great amongst you must be your servant. Isn't that a neat twist? And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. And I'm the leader in that, Jesus said. Even as the Son of Man came, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Lord Jesus came as a servant, the servant of Jehovah, the Isaiah 42, 52, 53 servant, whose life was poured out. Do you know, can you identify the chapter in the epistles where the Apostle Paul says that's the way you should be? Range through the epistles. Where does he say that? Where does he say, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus? Philippians, right? Who, being in the form of God, thought it not a, th a thing to be grasped at after or retain his prerogatives of deity to be equal with God, but emptied himself by pouring out his life. Let that mind be in you. And we said, well, we're not Christ. Paul says, I'm willing to do that. I'm ready to have my life poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice. I'm ready to do that. He says to Timothy, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for the church. And then he says, even your own guy, Epaphroditus, who you send up to bring the gift, he got sick here, and he was close to death, and he didn't want you to hear about it because you were worried about me before, and now you'll be worried about him. He didn't want to add to your trouble. And he says, and he was willing to have his life poured out on behalf of the Philippians who had sent him along. We're servants. That's what he's telling us. Key to Christian living. You remember when Jesus washed the disciples' feet? He said, I'm a servant, you're servants. You know these things, what's the next line? You know you're called to be servants, what's the next line? Happy are you, blessed are you if you do it. That's the truth of it. And these guys, right at the end of the Lord's life, Mama Zebedee comes along, make my boys something really big, exalt them over the other apostles. And Jesus says, you guys have missed it. And they're all angry. Why are they angry? Hey, if you're a servant mentality, you don't get angry with somebody else is exalted. They were having the same problem. Wait a minute, not him, me. That was their problem. We have come to serve. Even the Son of Man came to give his life. That's pretty good servitude, isn't it? Oh, these guys. They're going up to Jerusalem, and they're having a big-time fight over who's the greatest. It'll go right into the upper room discourse. And that's when they'll start to teach them this again. Do you see what I'm doing? Don't you get it? It's hard to get it. Do we get that we're servants? Isn't that a hard lesson to learn? Really is. Put other people first. <clears throat> you know how you can tell if you're a servant? If people treat you like one. That's the truth. You will have conveyed to them, yes, you can drop in my dorm room anytime you want. I'm always available for you. Yeah, I'll run you up to the store. That's a help. You're having trouble with your laundry? Let me, let me catch you up. It's easy to be a servant. It's always available. And if you establish a pattern of those kind of helpful things with everybody, when they have a need, they'll come to you, and you can say, good, 
They must think I'm a servant. That's what I want to be. That is the truth. And Jesus will tell us when he washes feet, you know all this kind of stuff. That's what makes life count. That's, that's what gives you the blessed life. Not being me first, but having the mind of Christ. That's such a big lesson, and his disciples haven't learned it yet. It takes a while. The Son of Man came to not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. He's making his way. He's on the Jericho Road now. Jericho Road's the road that goes right up to Jerusalem. He's almost there. And uh, we have some blind men coming. In uh, the Matthew account, there are two blind men. In the Mark and Luke account, uh, he, they only talk about one. Now, that's not a real hard thing to determine. There were two, and the two authors decided to talk about Bartimaeus. Uh, I think Matthew has the two in it because uh, here are two witnesses. You know, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, it shall be established. Here at the end of his public ministry, we're almost done with his public ministry. We only have to go Sunday, Monday, and, his and Tuesday, and his public ministry is over. Three more days after this. We're almost there. And uh, here are two witnesses that attest to the fact that he cured my blindness. Uh, as Jesus is going up the Jericho Road. It is also here that another, another of the people that the Pharisees so despise uh, comes to salvation. Uh, paragraph 158 on 174. This story we all know. You all know the story of Zacchaeus? Somebody rehearse that for me. Zacchaeus was a, a wee little man, was he? What did he do? He climbed up into the sycamore tree. Why? And as the Lord passed by, what did he say? Zacchaeus, come down. Why? I'm going to your house today. <laughs> That's the story. And again, as at the beginning, verse 7, they all murmured he had gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus demonstrated his faith by saying, I have distributed half of my goods to feed the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone... I restore fourfold. And he says salvation has come to the house of a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Just like he had told them earlier in the three-part story of the lost coin, the lost, uh, lost sheep, and the lost son. He had to go up uh, to see Jesus because he was short. This next paragraph is very important. I want you to pick out the controlling word in verse 11 that gives rise to the story Jesus tells in the rest. The controlling road. I want you to get the controlling word. Here it is. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. What's this story going to tell them? Pardon? What's the word? They did. What did they suppose, though? Immediately. This story is going to say, not immediately. That's the thing. This story talks about, from our perspective, the postponement of the kingdom offer. It's not from God's perspective. He had already said, I will build my church. So the kingdom has to be kicked off for a while. Paul talks about this in Romans 9, 10, and 11, where he says, blindness in part is come to Israel that the gospel can go to the Gentiles. And that's what's going to happen. They suppose that kingdom was going to appear immediately. Jesus tells them a story that says, no, there's going to be a gap between now and when the kingdom comes. Dispensationalism is the only interpretation of Scripture that makes any sense at all. Do you know that? Poor folk that don't have a, that kind of structure, they can't explain this at all. Jesus says, here's a story, and this is what the story is. came out of the history of their day. There was an a person in authority who was going to Rome to get a higher place of authority. 
And some of the people liked him and some that didn't. The people didn't like sent them a whole crowd, uh, sent the whole crowd to Rome and said, we don't want this man to be the ruler. We don't want this man to rule over us. Listen to what it says up there. Verse 14, we do not want this man to reign over us. That's what they said. We don't want this man to reign over us. Well, the man went and he got the kingdom and he came back. And Jesus says, uh, what's going to happen here? When he returned, having received the kingly power, he commanded these servants to whom he had given money to take care of to be called to him, that he might, known what they, uh, might know what they had gained by the trading. And one comes and says, Lord, your pounds made ten pounds. Uh, and he said, I'm good. You're, you'll have authority over ten cities. This is the millennial kingdom. When he comes back, people who have been faithful, like his disciples in the interim, will reign over ten cities, others over five cities. And then they come to another of the folk who did nothing. Lord, here's your pan. I, I buried it. And uh, here it is. I didn't lose anything. He said, I'll condemn you out of your own mouth, you wicked servant. You knew I was a severe man, taking up what I did not lay down, reaping what I did not sow. Why didn't you put it in the bank? At least get interest. He said, take it from this and give it to the other people. And I tell you that everyone who has will, will receive more, and one who has not will be taken away. These are his disciples. And he said, but those people who said, I don't want this man to reign over me, us, what's going to happen to them? He said, he's going to slay them. But as for these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them before me. And that's what happens. The Lord goes away, goes to heaven, as Peter says, waiting until his enemies be made his footstool. Then he will come back and establish his kingdom. And the people who had rejected him, the descendants of those people, will be sent to the bad place. That's the judgment of the nations, judgment of the Jews and of the Gentiles at the end of the tribulation when the Lord returns. He's going away for a while. That's what this story is all about. They supposed the kingdom was going to appear immediately. He could say, I told you I was going to be crucified. He already did, but that was hidden. But here's his parable. Supposing that the kingdom would come immediately. <coughs> He's coming to Jerusalem. He's going up to Jericho Road. It's close by, he's going to go next page to Bethany. We see him in Bethany. That's where Mary and Martha was. Who else is there? Lazarus. Is that neat? Here's resurrected Lazarus. Uh, six days before the Passover. That's how close we are to Good Friday. Jesus, before the beginning of the Passover week, Good Friday, uh, down that week, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was whom Jesus has raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. Martha served. Are we surprised at that? No. Lazarus was one of them at table with him. In the Matthew account, we read this was the house of, uh, Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. In this family setting, you have Simon the leper, you have the two sisters, Martha and Mary, and a brother, Lazarus, they're having supper together. Martha, just like she did the first time. Now, I don't see anybody complaining about Martha fixing the supper here, do you? Because Martha had learned her lesson. She's doing what Martha should be doing. Lazarus, the resurrected guy, is in there talking with Jesus. Wouldn't that have been a neat kind of... Wouldn't you love to have been at this table? And Jesus could say to Lazarus, how'd you like heaven? He said, well, it's kind of spooky. Didn't see many people there. <laughs> but all these, uh, I heard voices of something, and there were people, and they seemed to be localized, immaterial parts of all the saints from of old. There was a one guy there. I saw Enoch, and I saw Elijah, but that's it. You know, that had to be a great conversation. And he's back, and they're sitting at the table. Now, Mary does something. <coughs> she had been saving this very expensive ointment. Nard. As in spiked nard. Uh, anointing for burial. And, and she had been saving. It's just a nice alabaster vase or 
container with a seal in it. Costly ointment. Very expensive ointment. Worth a year's wages ointment. And Jesus is there. This is just before Triumphantry Sunday. Jesus is there, and, and they're reclining at table, and they would, I don't know how you could eat the way they ate. You know, lying down, sort of your head propped up. Seems to me you'd always be spilling stuff this way. Don't you think? It's an awkward way to eat, but that's what they did. Hey, customs are customs. And the feet would be extended out. <coughs> We've all seen pictures. Mary, Mary takes this very costly breaks it open, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the ointment. Years' wages. How would you describe that? How would you describe taking a, a vial of ointment and pouring it out on Jesus? It's, it costs a year's wages. How would you respond to that? G give me an adjective that describes that, like an adverb. That describes that action. Can you describe it in a word? They did. They were angry. Would you say this is extravagant? Don't you? Do you have a do you have a reticence to ever be extravagant about anything? Sometimes it's appropriate to be extravagant. Do you hear that? It doesn't make sense to spend that much. Don't spend a year's wages pouring a perfume on Jesus. You could do so much better with that. That's what all the disciples thought. Judas and all of them said, Ah, what a waste, you emotional woman. And Jesus says, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Do you hear what Jesus says? Extravagance when it's directed to me is a wonderful thing. Do you hear it? Be generous. You always have the poor with you. And whenever you will, you can do good to them. But you will not always have me, Jesus says. And here's a great verse. I quote this verse all the time. People always say, I wish I could do more. I wish I could make more of my life. I wish I had more time. I wish I could attend. I wish I could do this. And they're genuine wishes. Here's a great principle. We will never be able to do all we would like to do. But Jesus says of this woman, she did what she could. And that's a good thing to do. Don't be worried about the things you can't do for God. There'll always be more. But if you do what you can do, you've done all Jesus expects of you. She did what she could. That's an encouraging word for people who get frustrated, especially when you're dealing with people who are old or people who have lost capabilities of doing things and they really want to do more for the Lord. Here's a great verse from the lips of Jesus. She did what she could. And that's the standard of evaluation. And he says, and beside that, I truly, I say to you, whenever the gospel is preached in the whole world, people will talk about this story. So get off her back, you cold apostles. She did what she could. Now, Judas was really mad because that's a year's wages that he could have had. And that P.S. is there. When the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, top of 177, they came not only on account of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest, we pointed this out before, comes out of the story of the rich man and Lazarus. So the chief priest planned to put Lazarus also to death. That other rich man had said, you know, if one be raised from the dead, they'll believe him. And Jesus says, no, they won't. And one is raised from the dead named Lazarus, and they decided to kill him too, along with Jesus. If the Jews would have had the way, there have been four people crucified. Lazarus again, dies again, and he does anyhow. You turn the page. That's the end of all the preliminary up to Jerusalem. You turn the page, 179, we start the last week. 
So it's Sunday. 483 years had happened since the decree of Nehemiah, the decree of Artaxerxes and Nehemiah, had gone forth. Daniel, thanks to the prophet, the angel Gabriel, same Gabriel that talked to Zechariah and to Mary, Daniel had Gabriel talk, come and say, look, Daniel, <coughs> you're going to prophesy from the going forth of the decree of Artaxerxes, who's going to be one of the kings of, of uh, Persia, from the going forth of the decree that he gives to Nehemiah, to the building of the wall, to uh, the coming in of the, the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, will be exactly 483 years. Our Xerxes gives that prophecy 100 years after Daniel prophesies about it, about that. <clears throat> 450 years after that, Caesar Augustus gives a decree that moves everybody around so that Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Now those other 33 years have come. Jesus is 33 now. So you got 450 at his birth. 483 now. That was started by the decree of Artaxerxes, uh, completed by the decree of uh, Caesar Augustus to get Jesus born in the right place. And now comes the date, the exact date, 483 years to Nat Swisker. What does that do for you? Do you get a blessing out of that? How? What's that show you? What's that tell you? When you know that's the truth, this king does this, this king does this, the clock is ticking exactly, we come to try on Palm Sunday, and there it is. What does that tell you? Pardon? Apps, doesn't it? That is so wonderful. Prophecy is the extra thing. It tells us the God who writes this is the God who controls the world. The kings are jumping like puppets. Make a decree. Okay, here's a decree. What do you want, Nehemiah? Oh, here it is right there. There's my seal. He didn't know what he was doing for God, did he? He had no idea about that. Over the other end of it, you know, a, Caesar Gus is saying, we're going to need some more money. I decree a decree all the world should be taxed. He didn't know what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. He didn't know what God was doing. And God puts that all down. He's the God of prophecy. He's reliable. The scripture is precisely right. Think of that. That's the book we're reading. It's hot from God. I control all this. All the details. It's a truth prophecy. We, Peter will say, we have not followed cunningly devised fable. We have a more sure word of prophecy. I was in the holy man. I know what this is all about. I've seen it. And prophecy is even better than being an eyewitness. And here it is. This is happening. And you, you, you put your hand on this page and, and Daniel, uh, Daniel comes alive. The book of Daniel and the book of Nehemiah comes alive. And all these kings with the hard names are just uh, being tugged this way and that by the God who is behind the scenes controlling everything that happens. Everything. And they didn't even know it. They were acting out of their own apparent free will when they made all these decrees. And God is saying, do this, do that. They do it. So what happens? A great crowd who had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. He's on his way. He's on the Jericho Road. He's over in Bethany. He's making his way in now. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. Everybody repeat that next phrase. What's it say? Even what? Let's hear it. The king of Israel. What were they expecting on Palm Sunday? The king to come. That's what they were talking about. And they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage, Bethany, Mount of Olives. Go in the village opposite and get the cult. <coughs> and Jesus comes riding in. Look at the bottom of the page. Why are you untying the colt? Uh, I'm sorry, look at the left-hand side, uh, three quarters. Behold, your king is coming. This is a prophecy from Zechariah. Humble and mounted on an ass, and on the colt, the foal of an ass is a, 
uh, a donkey that's never been ridden on. Any of you ever ride on a horse that's never been ridden on? What happens? They don't seem very happy about it. That's right. They want you off the back. This donkey knew who was sitting on his back. The creator's there, and that donkey just comes riding right in. Hey, is a donkey an impressive way to enter into a kingdom? A conquering hero comes in on a white horse. Jesus is going to be the meek king in fulfillment of this prophecy of Zechariah. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on an ass's colt. His disciples did not understand this at first, but when Jesus was glorified, they had the aha experience. Okay? And the crowd on the next page, this is a great day. The crowd spread their garments on the road and cut branches from the trees and gave him a royal welcome. He wrote, rode along on their spread out garments, their, their laying out the welcome mat for him. Now, there's this little uh, P.S. in John. There's not much by, uh, about John in, from John in this passage, but look at it. Do you see 17, 18? The crowd that had been with him when he raised Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. Why was there a crowd on Palm Sunday? Why? Because the resurrection of Lazarus. The people who had seen that in Bethany just a few miles away had told everyone, and it spread through Jerusalem. He raised this guy from the dead who had been dead for four days. That's why Jesus stayed away a couple of days, and he had said, they're going to be glorified. The Lord's going to be glorified. Here he comes. And the crowds are there. Triumphal entry crowds are there because of the resurrection of Lazarus. That was the reason for that sign. Somebody says, how come the crowds were there? So many crowds, they've been not doing that. Nobody would follow him up to now. They were saying, are there a few going to be saved? Now there's a huge crowd. Where did they come from? From the resurrection of Lazarus. That's why. That was a Yankee Doodle A1 miracle. And the crowds came out like crazy for that. By Friday, the same crowds are going to be saying crucify. We'll find out why they do that. Those who went before, this is what they're saying. Hosanna, blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And look at what Mark says as he quotes out one of these shout outs. Blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that is coming. Can it be clearer than that? What they are all anticipating is Jesus sitting on the throne of David ruling over the nation of Israel. Here comes the king. The king is coming. The son of David to rule over Israel. That's what they're saying. <coughs> By crucifixion Friday, they will say, we have no king but Caesar. We're talking about literal kings, kids. Isn't that something he's ruling in my heart, mystery? This is over the nation of Israel. That's what all of the enunciations were about. If you're a disciple, respond to me on this. If you're a disciple and you're hearing these masses crying, blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. Here comes the king who's going to sit on the throne of David. How are the disciples feeling right now? Pardon? He's come. It's happening. They are so excited. Finally, in Perea, they were saying, Lord, are there few who will be saved? And now the mass of the city has turned out. And they are really excited. Oh, all that hard stuff. And they kept saying, no, 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 no. And it's all swung in our direction now. Here comes the king. As he was drawing near, the descendant of Mount of Olives comes down to Mount of Olives up into Jerusalem. A whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. Blessed be the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven. Glory on the highest. And the Pharisees. The Pharisees are going nuts. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I, I love it. Uh, Jesus says, I tell you, if they were silent, the very stones would cry out. The Pharisees look at one another and say, what are we going to do? We can't do anything. The whole world's going after him. The Pharisees are, are really, they've had it. 
the whole city's after Jesus now. And they say, rebuke it. He said, the Lord, if they, if they wouldn't shout, the stones would. He goes into the city. Look what he says. I wish it were true. Would that even today you knew the things that make for peace. But now, they're hid from your eyes. Do you skip this thing? Judicial blindness. For today shall come upon you when your enemies will cast up a bank and bat you and surround you and destroy the city. And that happens 70 A.D. when the uh, Emperor Titus sends in the troops and they destroy the city. That's only 40 years later. So he goes into Jerusalem and the crowds are in an uproar. He goes into the temple and just looks around. It's already late. He checked his Timex. It's late. We better head out to Bethany. And he goes back to Bethany. Sunday is simply triumphal entry, magnificent triumphal entry. They retreat to Bethany after having looked at the temple. All night long, Jesus is thinking about something he saw in the temple. What he saw in the temple was the same thing he saw there the first day he went into the temple. And uh, by the time he gets back into the temple, he is really ticked. Mm -hmm.